Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussions, news, and interviews, presenting the film scene with Ileana Douglas. Ileana is an actress, writer, author, and film historian with a need to discuss movies that borders on obsession. You'll learn the history of movies one great story at a time. The film scene is the deep cuts of movie podcasts, featuring movies we love by the people who made them. And now, Ileana Douglas. Hello, everyone. It's Ileana Douglas. Welcome to the film scene. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Graham. Jeff. Co-host and co- co-star now, right? Based on... Uh... What is it like to act with Ileana Douglas? This is a pretty cool moment just to pull back the curtain a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about what auditions are like in the yes. modern acting age. But we have a studio here. We have a little white room back there. So Ileana and I just shot an audition for something we can't really talk about yet. Yes. But I uh, was honored... For an audition for me. For Exactly, yeah, please. people always say to me... They're shocked that I have to audition for things. Yeah, I know. It's, Everybody it's, has to it's audition. It's the new business, right? Yeah. But I was uh, honored and humbled to be your scene partner, and uh, I think I did okay, right? You were great. <laughs> I thought you were I thought you were terrific. I said, I said, they're going to send it to you. They're going to go, I don't know about the girl, but the guy. <laughs> we want that guy. Sign him up. I don't know if there's there's a, not a huge need for like young straight white males with dark hair in their twenties right now. I think it's a pretty competitive demo, but uh, who knows? Maybe I'm the next Miles Teller. But uh, it's so interesting because you get these you know uh, self tapes now, and uh, I don't know if it's good or bad. You, much of things are self are self taped. Yeah. So the more, but we added all this production. To design to it, I thought it was I spruced it up a bit. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I thought we did a. I thought we did a good job. Plus, I could go back and. Plus, you aren't nervous because you can go back until, you know, until you get it right. So, what do you prefer? I mean, like, I'm sure there's pros and cons to both the taped audition and the in person audition. <sighs> I don't know. The I mean, I always think it's better to go in in person right. and kind of, you know, knock their socks off. But then on the other hand, I've had experiences i remember years ago there was something i like i basically i went on you know tape and i had the role and then they said the director just wants to meet you and i didn't i said oh god i'm gonna meet him and he's gonna and that's exactly what happened i met the director and he said you're she's too nice to play this role Mm. so that was a that was a killer so in that sense the tape would have been um, preferable. Probably would have been, uh, you know, been better off. But- I feel like auditioning is sort of the the universal equalizer for all actors, right? It's interesting yeah. because no matter how prideful or whatever you are as an actor, I'm sure it's very humbling to step into that room. You know, everyone's kind of starting from square one. Well, it's an interesting thing. You as a as a non actor, <laughs> you must get nervous anyway. Yeah. You said to me, "Oh, I have to be on camera." I was, uh, all of a sudden, I'm in a scene acting with one of my film heroes from the '90s. <laughs> Pretty cool. Make sure to screenshot from the 90s. that one. Wait well, a minute. From, from everything. I mean, just in terms of yeah, just so. just in terms of when I grew up. What I mean. Yeah. My cinematic taste was shaped around a lot oh, of the movies. You mean you're, you're not watching Goliath? Well, or... I am watching Goliath as well. Yeah. I I hear now in retrospect why that comment might have not been the most elegant <laughs> I've ever said on air. But it's more what I mean is a lot of the movies. I mean, you yes. have a long, that's, very that long career, your... but that was my that was my how I sure. shaped my cinematic taste was you know indies, '90s indies, and and what was your uh, what when when we when you met me? What what were you surprised? Were you surprised by something? In person? Mm, yeah. Not necessarily. I mean, I think same? you, I, when I picture a lot of your roles, I do, I mean, you've played so much, but I do think quirky, I think big, I think interesting. I'm quirky. I invented the word quirky. I think so. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, you know, that's such an essential part of that time. But it's I think the bangs. <laughs> maybe. Um, but you are, I think. The bangs. If, and the thing that stood out to me was just very grounded, eat, good conversationalist. I think yes. the fact that you're able to escape on camera like you do, but then also, you know, I, I love being in the room when you interview because I do like oh, the grounded conversational approach you bring to these discussions. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was I saw Dolomite is my name last night. Uh, oh, my God. It's just so much fun. What a great anecdote. I mean, look at this. So and, fun. Uh, at the new Bev, saw it on film with Larry Karaszewski, who's one of our friends here, a uh, great filmmaker, Ed Wood. Uh, People versus O.J. Simpson, and and it's kind of the return of Eddie Murphy, and he just looks like he's having a blast. 
Uh, and I think he's going to get nominated for an Oscar. Wow. I, I, I dare I say I think he's going to win. This might be the year of male-nominated comics because I hear mm. Adam Sandler and Noah Baumbach's movies, the also, also a dark horse for Best Actor this year. Interesting. So we'll have interesting. to see. This is the uh, comic act, maybe the comic actor's year for. Well, what was interesting about this, and I haven't seen the Joker, but but uh, what Eddie Murphy, what Larry Karaszewski said that Eddie Murphy said about the character was uh, that. He is a, a, which I love, he's a loser who refuses to lose. <laughs> and I I just really, that is such a great uh, kind of a motto. And so you're rooting for him. He is this, just this loser, but he, he with no talent, who just goes on. But he is, he does have a talent. You know, he eventually sort of finds himself. Um, there's also some, interesting there's a lot of music in it so it's a great uh um kind of they talk about him ha- ha- you know the roots of rap music and uh it's just a great cast everybody in it some surprises and the energy of the film is really it just moves uh along quite a bit but man i i just had a blast seeing it and at the new bev and then they showed i had to come here so i couldn't stay for it but then they showed the real dolomite wow. movie Afterwards, God bless the new Bev. It's just the greatest place. In it's the an world. important one of those iconic Hollywood landmarks, and I yeah. love that they showed it the new Bev too. Because you think of the types, you think of the type of movie that Dolomite is, and yeah. you can't not say that Tarantino is inspired by black exploitation. You know, I yes. don't think Tarantino would have the career he has if it weren't for these movies. No, absolutely. And you, again, you get to you know some of the scenes of Eddie Murphy recreating scenes that we know very well it's just a completely enjoyable thing you know it's uh look at the clothes just the clothes clothes by ruth carter okay uh by the way are the clothes are fantastic production design fantastic script of course and like i said the directing just move the story just moves and uh it's like a musical Mm. i really thought it was like a musical so it's coming on netflix at the end of the I think uh, at the end of the month, and we're going to have Larry here. I can't wait. Oh, my God. He said that people just wanted to come by the set and, you know, hang out. Oh, my gosh. Be in scenes with Eddie Murphy. Well, I love a biopic, and you you mentioned the losers who refuse to lose, and um, <laughs> we're going to be interviewing uh, Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi's children, who worked yes. so much with Ed Wood, and he's kind of the first filmmaking loser who refused to lose, right? That's true. And uh, uh, when is that? That's October 27th. Sunday, October 27th. So yeah. for anyone who's local and wants to hear Ileana get into that, um, that's going to be at the Alex Theater in Glendale. Fantastic. I'm, yeah. I don't think I've ever been there, so I look, cool. I look forward to that. Um, Great. That'll be fun and i am getting a quick uh producer correction i think i said adam sandler's in noah bombach's new movie i was confusing that because he was in noah bombach's old movie right the meyerwitz stories yes he's in a benny softy movie this year i'm getting all of my benny Os- softy now i don't know who benny softy is i don't know if i do either me. so he um it's the film uncut gems mm, that's right okay and benny softy has he's done a few dramas in these in the past but this is his biggest film he's this done is yet. his big year we'll try to get him on the show wow wouldn't that be crazy Definitely. adam sandler versus Eddie Murphy. I well, I think that might people I'm are saying. I'm an Academy it could be the year. member. You're yes. gonna have to court me. <laughs> I'm Eddie all the way. Sorry. All right, yeah, we'll get them both I'm giving, on there. I'm giving it away. I love it. Come on, he deserves an Oscar for God's sake. It's time. He's Eddie Murphy. Yes. Uh, sadly, I was in Pluto Nash. <laughs> No, you know what? However sad I had fun. Yes, it's I'm sure it was a fun set. And even those movies that haven't aged as well, they still have an element of being iconic about them. It was a misstep. Them. That was, you, a well, misstep. you know a movie when it's got too many stars in it. But, you know, Jay Moore and I were doing action. And I was like, Eddie Murphy, I mean, I, I was like, I don't need to look at a script. I get to be in a scene with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Just embrace it. Yeah. So that was fun. Just uh, he's a very quiet person. Mm. You know, that was my big take away from that I, I said to him Mark, what are you doing here we were shooting in um uh where were we quebec so odd anyway we were in quebec and i said um so uh we're like what do you do in your off hours are you going out any great restaurants or anything he goes no i don't leave my room <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> introverted. I thought that was so funny. I said, not even for like a hamburger. No one, you don't have any friends. Or... <laughs> but it's so funny. He's one of those great, you know, people that you, you get so scared. They keep, don't talk to Ed. Don't look at Eddie. Don't talk to Eddie. And then, you know, by day three, you're thinking, hey, the guy's probably pretty lonely because nobody wow. is, you know, what happens is it, you get so insulated by your people that at a certain point, I often wonder, do they wonder, why is nobody talking mm. to me or looking at me? Yeah, it's, so. if, if the world creates, if the world puts you on a pedestal, yeah, people start reaching up and it's not your fault people behave that way around you. I feel like fame is different these days, except for maybe Madonna, as soon yeah. as I said that. I'm, I'm sure she, you know, she's in a, who, another person I've, who I've worked with. Oh, man. But, uh, uh, but fame seems to be different. Like the new thing is to be relatable and to be... On Twitter. Yeah, and... Well, do selfies with people. Yeah, it's it's changed. I mean, you know, I, I, don't, think, I don't think being aloof works anymore. No, and it's interesting because you could almost argue there are no real stars anymore. Like it's yeah. it's hard for actors on their own to draw box office numbers. Now, I mean, you look right. at Robert Downey Jr., who when he's playing Tony Stark, it's a guaranteed yeah. box office hit. But if he's in The Judge, which I thought was a pretty decent movie, it's not going to generate. You know, I've, I've heard it argued that Melissa McCarthy is the last movie star. She's one of the few that is a reliable box office draw. But even mm -hmm. Tom Cruise, you know, if he's in the wrong movie, people might not go see it. It's a different it's yeah. a different industry now. So Wow, that's fascinating. That's really true. That's really true. But you think of people and you have to know about their lives and all this. Yeah. All right, we're going to go down a rabbit hole. And we, we, uh, I, we're going to talk about uh, Kim Krizan's career. She uh, wrote this book right here, which you can get. It's called Spy in the House. Uh, Anais Nin, and uh, and there it is. She's written other books, but uh, she has a close working relationship with director Richard Linkletter. She appeared as an actress in Slacker and Waking Life, and she's a co-writer on Before Sunrise and Before Sunset, which was nominated for an Academy Award. And she's branched out into writing comic books and graphic novels. Do you like hearing about yourself? As I hear you? <laughs> it's a strange. <laughs> she wrote 2061 comic series. Uh, Zombie Tales 1, 9, and 11 by Boom Studios. And her most recent project, as I was saying, is this biography on uh, diarist Aeneas Nin. And uh, I can't wait for you to talk about her, ladies and gentlemen. Kim Krizan, thanks Hi. so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And the first question, we always you know, start, even though you're primarily an author now, but would you go back to acting if, if you were... Oh, for fun, I feel yeah. like it's fluid, right? Oh, yeah, it's fluid. Show business. Is... Fluidity. We're all about the fluidity with the creativity, right? I, I see so many people like that. You know, like Griffin Dunn is mm. in this year of Goliath, but for many years he went, he was writing and directing, and now he's kind of back acting. And They all so, come from the same source, maybe. I, yeah. He started out as a producer, believe it or not. Many, many. The only reason he became a producer is to produce movies that he could be in. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's kind of crossing over that left and right brain with the yeah. the business and the creativity. We're thinking, well, that's why I wanted to be a writer because I thought, well, the only way I'll get to do anything is if I write it and get to be in it. So that was, you know, again, my sort of theory of I just wanted to be in show business. Yeah. <laughs> some some form of it. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we always start with my favorite question. Uh, do you remember the first movie you saw and who took you to see it? My mother and I went to, is it the Cinerama Dome on mm -hmm. Hollywood Boulevard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I was four. And the movie was Fantastic Journey. Is that the, is that the title? With Raquel Welch. Yes. Oh, God, that movie is so great. So Raquel is a scientist. <laughs> and she and a team of scientists needed to be shrunk down right. to be shot into the body of a, a of an ailing genius scientist. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like going into inner space or something, but it was the human body. And yeah. I I would I think I was four. I believe this was about sixty six. Mm -hmm. I, I think I was four. And I I was so deeply affected by the fantastic journey. And then I remember 
I played Fantastic Journey for <laughs> many, many months after seeing the movie, but I, I very vividly remember going across the street to the Bob's Big Boy afterward, and our waitress had the most excellent beehive and winged eyeliner. <laughs> It was a, it was an important day in my life. Fair. Wow. We have Raquel. Yeah. We have Bob's Big Boy. Like there she oh, is. Oh, there she is. I can imagine that would be a great movie to see when you're a kid because you must have really believed it that she was in the body that they were all in this body that oh. that could really happen. And and look at the rad outfit. The, yeah. The skin tight. It's a wetsuit sort of thing and it's white. Yeah. And she was swimming and there were antibodies. I remember the antibodies were clinging to her and the other scientists uh. had to pull the antibodies off of her wetsuit. <laughs> oh, no, I want to see it. I, <laughs> Stephen so Boyd is in that, who's also one of my favorite actors. He he His career didn't really pan out. Stephen Boyd, he was in Ben-Hur. And, yeah, handsome. Yeah, do you know that he faked his... He was Irish and he, he faked his... American accent because wow. he was afraid. Did he really? Yeah, he was afraid that if he had an accent, that he would never work. It wouldn't fly. No. So I saw this documentary on him, and it was so jarring yeah. because he only started to talk in his normal voice very late in his career. But by that point, he was doing episodics and things like that. Very weird. So he really passed. <laughs> He's an American. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed like. Is he really think he wasn't going to get work just because he was Irish? That's interesting. Yeah, it was very, very odd. Very, He was yeah. an interesting guy. But anyway, now I want to see that movie. That sounds That's fun. That's great. Um, so when you were, so you started out doing some acting, but were you, like I was saying before, were you writing, acting? It just sort of fell with it, working with uh, Richard Linkletter and his early films. I absolutely fell into it. So I was actually working on my master's thesis on, on East Nin. Mm -hmm. And I heard from someone, this was, I was living in Austin, Texas at the time. And I heard from someone that there was a little tiny student film being shot and they were auditioning actors and I should go to, and I, I said, Oh, I've never acted. You know, I, I, you know, no. And they say, you really should go down just for fun, just for fun. So I went and auditioned and the audition consisted of Rick asking me what I was doing with my life. And I said, I'm working on a master's thesis on Ani Eastman. And we talked about that. And then lo and behold, I got a part and that was in Slacker. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, he put me in Slacker and then, uh, he gave me a part in Days and Confused in the meantime, I finished my master's thesis, and he kept asking me, can I read that master's thesis on Ani Nin? And uh, I didn't really take him very seriously, but finally, uh, you know, he called me, um, I, I gave it to him, and he, he called me on a Monday and asked me to meet him on uh, uh, Tuesday or something. And I met him, and he had my master's thesis sitting there, and he said, I want you to write a movie with me. Wow. Wow. So... Uh, that was based on you no, know, I this you know I it's just I was like oh, well I've never written a movie, mm -hmm. and he said I don't I've read your I've read your work you, you can write and I said well what would it be about and he said I don't know boy meets girl, and that was that. <laughs> so he in the meantime he had to finish post production on Dazed and Confused, and uh, and then so we when he was done with that we. Was sat down and wrote before sunrise. And how, what is the? How, it's such a great title. It, uh, the and and then there are some roots of truth that he met. Um, he had met a girl and had an experience with her. But is that? So I think it's based on my uh, train experiences. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, when I was about twenty, I had been in a car accident. I had gotten money because the car the accident was not my fault. So I got money from the insurance. And I uh, went, I just, with alacrity, I got on a plane and jumped over to England. I wanted mm -hmm. to go to England, and I had a Brit Rail pass. So I Brit Railed all over England, and while there, I would meet people on right. the train and have amazing conversations and uh, get off the train, and we would spend the whole day talking and walking. And then I did it again uh, several years later. Uh, I went to Europe and the the main experience I'm thinking of, this happened with a number of different people in a number of different cities, but the main experience was that I got on a, a train in Spain, 
and uh, sitting across from me was a young man from Norway. And we took the train all the way to Paris, and uh, in those many hours, we had a really intense discussion. I really got to know him well. I mean, and the thing is, is when you're trapped on a, in a train car with somebody for many hours, and you're going to part ways, mm-hmm. why not just be honest and be candid and talk about mm. what's really on your mind? Right. So these these relationships I would have with people in Europe and England were all just they seem very pure, you know, and uh, we we had to part ways in Paris. So I, we both got off the train car and shook hands and, um, you know, goodbye, goodbye and went our separate ways. And then a few minutes later, we crossed paths on the street and we were like, hi. <laughs> and he, he were like, why don't we hang out for the day? Because <laughs> his train wasn't yeah. going on. He was going to continue north uh, back home to Norway. It, it, he, had a, he had about three hours. And so we were like, well, let's just hang out. So we hung out for, for a few hours, just having continuing our conversation in Paris. So that's really where mm-hmm. the origin of the Before Sunrise idea came from. Mm. Wow. I mean, I'm kind of floored because it, it does, it's one of the things I always talk about, the, the, uh, where I thought the origin was, was completely different, was more based with Richard Linkletter, you know, uh, so that's, it's always shocking when you find out so other, oh, somebody else was, uh, it was their, you know, because that, that sounds really truthful and really much more the, of what the story became. When we first sat down to write, uh, this was in my living room in Austin, we all we knew is that it was a boy meets girl story. Right. And there needed to be some sort of finite, you know, meeting and leaving quality. And that's how his movies are in general, like the slackers, the, the course of a day and days and confused the course of a day. And so there needed to be something very finite. It wasn't going to be a movie right. that stretched on for you know for months over the course of these people's lives. And so um, I I knew then that the relationships I'd had that had been intense, honest, meaningful to me. That the first thing that popped in my mind with these train experiences. I mean, right. I, you could even have this um, you know on a plane or whatever. But mm-hmm. mine happened to be on trains, and I love trains. I find mm-hmm. trains to be very romantic. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. And I remember that era too, because my brother and I in the mid '80s and then later '80s traveled all around Europe. You know, pre cell phone. Yes. So you really didn't. You had to. You know, you'd get on the train and you didn't know. You know, we got all we had. We got everything out of Let's Go Europe. There was that oh, book. me too. Uh, I had Let's Go. Yeah. <laughs> Does that still even exist anymore? Probably not. Is that Rick Steves? I don't know. It was a no, big. No, I don't think a, so. It was a big book. Big thick book that was called Let's Go Europe, and it was basically every hostel or every cheap yeah. place to go, and you literally had no idea until you got to Paris, like at ten wow. o'clock at night, where you were staying. You know, it was fun. That's what I was using: a backpack, backpack yeah. with my Let's Go, a very <laughs> few items of clothing, and then a bunch of novel, a bunch of paperback novels. Wow. Yeah, no cell phone, which. But that I think was, that's why I like the movie so much because I was like, oh, I feel like I've had this experience, you know. It was absolute heaven because no one knew where you were. I mean, this thing yes. now of people knowing where you are and they can track you and they can call you and they can text you. Interesting. People think that no, 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 no. It, yeah. I remember being at one point in uh, the south of France and by myself and. I, I realized, my God, no one has any idea where I am. Wow. You so know? romantic. It's, it is interesting. I come from a bit of a different generation, and I think that's lost. And that's part of the reason I do love the Before Trilogy is because it captures a time that already feels nostalgic. You know, it's, it's a totally different experience now. It's very romantic. Is it because it's the pre-internet? Yeah, I think so. I think like even the idea of you can kind of get it in an Uber if you have a friendly Uber driver, but mm-hmm. the ability to get on a train or a plane and talk to people, it's kind of gone, right? I don't you love I just I love getting in a cab or something or an Uber and I love grilling the guy. Me too. Or girl. I always talk to my I Uber driver. Them. Especially in LA, most of them aren't from the country, so you can find out where they're from and their family. A lot of Armenians, especially in this part of town, but 
I you love know? it. Yeah, you can't really do it. Maybe Uber is the last bastion of uh, random conversation. So in the then, did you take part in the casting um, I saw, process? I saw the tapes of the people who, who were being um, auditioned. And things definitely changed once uh, Ethan Hawke wanted to be in the role because then um, cause it, at one point early on, we thought that the movie might be shot in America with an, on Amtrak. Oh. And mm-hmm. um, when, when there was an American actor and a European company was expressing interest in producing the film, mm-hmm. that meant it would need to be shot in whatever European country. And in this case, it was Vienna. So it was Austria. So we, we then had to cast uh, a, a European woman. Mm-hmm. And so that I remember seeing auditions by a number of women before that uh, those final decisions were being made. I remember Lily Taylor did a beautiful audition. I loved it. Um, we, had, we were talking about auditions at the top of the show. Were too. you? Yeah, just you know, they're there in the ether. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There were there were great great auditions, um, and Julie Delpy was cast in the role. Yes, so. And the uh, how did you like shooting in Vienna? I love Vienna. That was, in fact, one of my first trips. That's where we landed in Vienna, and I just thought it was beautiful. Not what I expected at all. Ro- yeah, romantic, beautiful, and kind of that German feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, and it a quietly glamorous mm-hmm. kind of place. I liked it. Did you go to the big Ferris wheel yes. where they shot the third man? I, yes. I liked all that. We, uh, we stayed with someone. And again, this was so crazy. Uh, my, I had a cousin who had a tutor, and he said, hey, if you're ever in Vienna, look, look, not even look me up. My sister lives there. She's in the you know Vienna Opera. And that's, oh. we stayed with her. And oh, went to God. the, I mean, it was crazy. We went to the opera, and but it, you could do, thir- you know, you could just have a piece of paper and say, "Your brother said we could <laughs> right. stay here." Yeah. My brother, of course, fell madly in love with her. Oh, did he? Yeah, as he, he should. And have. he ended up staying. Oh, did he? Yeah, he broke up her relationship she had with a person and stuff. So I, I mean, I totally related to the movie. I just sort of felt like, yeah, those. I had to go home. I cried. <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever see my brother again. It's a romantic place. Yeah, he was, he, you know, it was great. Um, so anyway, so the shooting of that, and then with the final outcome, were you pleased with the movie? Yeah, yeah, I was pleased with it. Uh, it had that the feeling, you know, it had that romantic feeling. The the character um, of the female character was based to a large degree on me on my on my travels and. And then Julie added a bit of her personality in there too, and I I was pleased with it and rather amazed. And I remember when we saw the uh, when I saw the cut. I remember it was a small group of us, Rick and producer and a few people in Austin uh, went to a theater, and it was just us early in the morning. And I remember when the Columbia lady came on mm-hmm. with her torch. I remember it it, it really hit me. Yeah. That this is it's real a movie and was that the first time your name was on a credit as a screenwriter? Yes. Wow. So yes. That must have been exciting. Yeah. And then how? Um, so then it was many years. Did, did you? How long was it before you thought? Well, maybe there should be a sequel. Or did you always think? Gee, maybe we'll revisit this in a few years. I think Rick mentioned it as a possibility. It had. It had. Um, it was, it was a small film, you know, it wasn't a big blockbuster yeah. film at all. And so I think that maybe there was a certain amount of surprise with how well it did, you know, it's kind mm-hmm. of arty and sort of Euro and mm-hmm. all that. Yeah. And so it, when it turned out that people were, um, really loving it and it had lo- some longevity and the critics were still talking about it and people, you know, I would meet people who had traveled to Europe because of this movie and, went on trains and met the love of their life. And it kind of had this longevity. So I think people were sort of clamoring to know a little bit. And he would mention it to me every once in a while. Um, I think that we w- started working on it, I believe it was 99, 2000. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started working on a sequel. Um, 
and it took a while. It took a while to pull it all together. It ended up coming out, I think it was 2004. Right, because by that point, Ethan's career had really kind of blossomed. And so I'm sure Pete, it was hard. he had to work around his schedule, I'm, yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah, I'm I, probably so. You know, and plus, if you have such a perfect image of the first movie, you want to make sure the second one is right. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're kind of reluctant to mess that up. Right. <laughs> So then on the uh, on the so then on the second one the a, the actors contributed more or they want they wanted to contribute more like was that an uneasy easy thing because that's always a tough um, I would think as a writer I I would find that very tough I, obviously I, I there's so many things I've done where I've done improv but it's the writer creates the structure. Of the movie, I always use the example of "To Die For." It's a Buck Henry script, but within that very tight script, Gus Van Zandt wanted us to improv, and it was at times it was it was tough having Buck stand right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was very very tough because obviously I love Buck Henry and I respect him, and you know it's amazing. You want to please him and say his words, but you also want the avant garde ness of Gus Van Zandt. So can you talk a little bit about walking that line and what that what that's like as a writer? Well, so there was a beautiful completed script. Uh, I'd done the majority of the work on it and it was really great. And then um, the actors said that they wanted credit. So at that point it was m- me and, and Rick. But the actors wanted credit and so they you know they could hold up the project if they wanted I mean they could they could refuse to be a part of the project and they uh, were did uh, in the first movie they did contribute some ideas some you know add add little things here and there so they ended up bringing in a lot of their ideas and came on as writers and yeah it's 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 um it takes things in a slightly different direction Mm -hmm. sometimes than you have in mind right you know you know how collaboration is it's you you have to make room for for other people and their views so that sometimes it dilutes what you want and sometimes it greatly adds and elevates so I guess I guess that's the trade-off there. Mm. If, if you're working on your own, you are the god of your project. If you are collaborating, you have to have a certain flexibility. Right. I would say, you know, it's interesting because when you see Mike Lee movies, it's a Mike Lee film, even though everybody is improving. Same thing on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Wes Anderson, I think a little bit too. Yeah. That same kind of auteur vision, but it still feels loose in the movie. It's a very odd thing, as I said. I've been on both sides of it, where where if you have a right, you know, but yet it is the writer who is has an overall view. You're coming up with dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's you know you're not. You know, I also write scripts, so mm-hmm. it's it, 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 there's such a difference between you know adding a line here or there. It, it's a it's a it's an interesting thing to 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 talk about on you know as I say on both sides because m- many actors contribute. Joe Pesci, you know, um, you think I'm f- a funny guy. That's entirely improv. Yeah. Yet he's not he didn't demand a screen credit. You know, so it's an right. odd thing. I I feel. It's part of maybe just the filmmaking process, right? If you're a it's writer collaborative. who wants to work in film or an actor who wants to work in film, you just have to be prepared to know that it can't solely be one person's vision ever, right. probably. Yeah. In Slacker, for example, since I acted in Slacker, um, most like, my part was written by me and the, the people I work, worked with in the scene wrote their parts. And I believe most of the people in Slacker wrote their parts, I believe. I know many did, at least. And and yet, how does a does a movie company sell that? How do you how do you credit all those people for their for their bid or their monologue? And in Waking Life, I was in Waking Life, and my uh, monologue in that is was based on a monologue I, I give as a or gave as a teacher. And yet, 
you know, so how does the, the, I think, I think there, there comes a point where the director is actually a character who is being marketed Mm. to the public, you know, as, you know, perhaps the, the, the boyish, you know, genius, when in fact, it's a collaboration. Right. And a lot of people have contributed to build up this image. So, um, you know, sometimes that's frustrating for the people who work on a, a movie and the people who are contributing mm-hmm. to a movie. But I, I guess I guess it depends on the, the ego. You know, I guess it depends on how what people how people view. I know that um, De Niro contributes to parts, but he will just put a little initial on the script where he will may change change things up and just put an initial. He certainly, you know, isn't barging his way into a credit or anything. So I guess he, he has he has a healthy enough ego that he, you know, it's not a problem for him. Yeah, that's what I always say. It's a very awkward thing, as I said. Mm-hmm. I've, I And both uh, a fact, I've been in certain movies where I've seen, you know, where, again, you're asked to fix up the script a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you feel like, yeah. like uh, yeah. I wish I had the dough for you know all the screenwriting uh, little things anyway regardless you got you went on you were nominated for an academy award uh and alan alda stepped on your dress and just, alan alda it was so cute that's too exciting. i had a little train and uh mm-hmm. and he stepped on he stepped on it and it was really adorable because <laughs> i turned around and his wife whacked him oh, no. <laughs> he was so sweet he was really sweet and it was it was fun he said mr alda you can <laughs> step on my i think i did <laughs> Now, is it more fun? It was the parties and the lead up more fun than the actual award ceremony, um, or is it just all exciting? I think actually getting to the <laughs> event. So as we were pulling up and I was getting out of the car, I looked and there was someone standing across the street. I'm, as I say this, I almost want to laugh. There's someone standing across the street with a huge sign that said, you're going to hell. <laughs> and I, I thought, this is so, this is so I, the irony of this is so great, you know, because it's supposed to be one of the wonderful moments of my life. <laughs> and someone's like condemning you to hell. And, it is a long ceremony. I mean, if you view it that way. So. I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, but, but once we, we, I remember we were on the red carpet and we got, and it just felt really, it felt really magical to be there. People were warm and wonderful. Who were you most excited to meet or did uh, you meet? Uh, Pierce Brosnan's lovely wife came up to me to talk mm-hmm. about my dress. And, and so we had a little conversation. I, nice. and, then, and then Pierce came up and my husband about died, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he, he what a was classy. Was he post bond or was he was he in his bond? Was he his post bond, I believe. Okay. Yeah, it would have been. Yes, I think Golden Eye was 99, Tomorrow Never Dies was 2000. So oh. Another Irishman. Yeah, it's true. We've, we've made a connection. He's, Stephen Boyd. Oh, right. He okay. Did, he did not hide his Irish accent. I right. think he's Irish. I believe he is. Maybe Scottish. He's yes. definitely from, from across the pond. I, might I be think wrong. he's Irish. He's yeah. Pretty, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm he's lovely. Uh, anyway. Quick question before yes, we move on. I would just love to hear... What is it like working with Rick? Like, especially as a writer, I'm always interested in hearing about writing collaborations. What was the actual like uh, nuts and bolts process of putting together those scripts? We we uh, did a lot of talking. He's mm-hmm. a fantastic listener. He's always interested in what you're thinking, what you're reading, what your latest thoughts are. And I think he's a bit of a connoisseur of interesting people. Mm. So. When we got together to work on Before Sunrise, it wasn't yet called Before Sunrise, but we were in my living room and we just talked for about five days about relationships. Um, we, I remember we both had our little notebooks and we were, we were but, but mainly we were just talking, ex- exchanging stories. And at the end of about five days, we had... Well, the structure came right away with this, the whole train thing, that they meet on the train. They're going to have to part ways like I had to part ways with my Norwegian boy in uh, Paris. And so there's our structure. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then things hap- are going to have to happen. So we, at the end of the five days, we, I remember, had index cards where he'd, we'd written down a number of possible things that could happen. And I remember they were on the my 
living room floor and we were moving the index cards around and imagining some sort of dynamics, you know, happening. At that point, I think we may have taped them on a big poster board and moved over to his apartment and sat down in front of his computer because I didn't yet have a computer. It was 2003. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sorry, it was uh, 1993. So I didn't yet have a computer. And we sat down in front of his computer. Uh, it was set up with form- the formatting. I don't know if Final Draft existed yet. Version 1. <laughs> Version 1, okay. Yeah. Wow. And... Uh, he, he he would sit down and write, and then he'd get up, and then I'd sit down and write. It, we, this was in the middle of the night, by the way. We wow. worked in the night. And this was a quick process. Uh, the whole thing from beginning to end took 16 days, from starting at my house on day one till the end. We would just sit down, and in the midst of us sitting down, like taking turns, the other one of, would be pacing around, thinking... Um, you know, we'd be talking about random things, uh, you know, and then, oh, I have an idea and jump down in the chair and type it out. At some point in the evening, we'd walk down to, I believe it was Circle K or was it like Quickie Picky or Piggly Wiggly? (laughs) (laughs) It was one of the convenience store. He would get a symphony bar. I would get, remember Tab? Yes. Oh, I love tab. Uh, it's it's a be- uh, like a beverage for, yeah. for ladies. Yeah. Uh, highly caffeinated. <laughs> highly caffeinated, the hot pink can. Yeah. And um, and that, so this would be kind of a, you know, for hours, I would say good stretch of hours. So, and we finished it in about 16, so five days, let's say, at my house. And then the rest of us, say, 11 or so days, I guess, in front of his computer. Wow. Boom, boom. Cool. That's yeah. fast. Yeah. That is fast. My goodness. And then you, so after that, was that the last screenplay that you worked on? Did you, you went to, you wrote books and uh, I love this uh, original, The Trade Secrets of the Femme Fatale <laughs> book. That well, sounds like a lot of fun. After the success of Before Sunrise, I had suddenly had a ton of meetings. Mm. And everyone told me that I needed to write a script. And I had never written on my own. But I went home and I wrote a script about Mata Hari. And I didn't, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure how this is, was going to go working on my own. But I wrote a script about Mata Hari. And it got so much attention and was optioned and optioned and optioned. But I'll tell you, it was, we're talking the mid nineties and what I was told, you're going to just love this. <laughs> what I was told was, well, you have a female protagonist. So this just is, you know, this is just going to be pretty much impossible here. And it's, it's a tragedy because Matahari does get executed at the end. And, and, and so, so I was basically told by everyone and their dog that it was a, an amazing piece of work and then it'd be um you know we'll option it and all that but can you write the sexy sorority sister story for us and it was like wow i love that bait and switch (laughs) (laughs) that's fun (laughs) the sexy sorority version there you go Sounds about right. I wasn't in a sorority. I don't know how that works. <laughs> God, that's so, yeah, that must be challenging. And then whatever happened to that script, it just sits there. It sits there and breaks my heart. Yeah. It's a great script. It's a, it's a really good script. So, it, What do you think, Netflix now, miniseries? I think we talk about a lot on this show. It feels like streaming is the new sort of like indie film, indie m- movie, you know? Yeah, yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. I mean, I love it. It's because it's, it's. It's a it's a feminist kind of thing. It's perfect, yeah. perfect for about right now, but but in the mid '90s, it was not the the climate. Right, you know, the climate was all wrong for that story. Hmm. I yeah. felt like like you know like women like w- there was an audience for it, but I was told there wasn't. Wow, <laughs> I love yeah anything with Mata Hari. She was a great spy and femme fatale. Yeah, and used her wily ways to bring men. The only m- movie that I'm aware of is the Greta Garbo film, which and, is. And Very then there stylistic. was a, then there was the porn version. <laughs> <laughs> I did, did not you know, know about that. No, no, I didn't know about that. Yeah, one. Sylvia Crystal, I think. But that's, Hari, that's funny. Yeah. yeah, but in my version, see, uh, I did some deep background there. Uh, she was wrongly executed. Wow. She was wrongly executed. She was set up. So. What a dream was, role, though. That's the thing. I think yeah. actresses would. Who be, wouldn't want to play Mata Hari? Yeah, especially with such a complicated third act. You know. There were there were big actresses interested. I'm sure. Yeah, 
And it would it would be a big, big part. Yeah, because that means it just covers the gamut of her life and then being wrongly accused and being executed. Wow. So. Well, whoever is listening now, they can pick that up. Uh, the uh, Okay, I want to get to your book uh, is it, because, again, another person who... The only movie I'm there's a couple of movies. Henry and June is the one I mainly think of, mm-hmm. Aeneas Nin, and it's uh, it's a bit clunky, mm-hmm. I guess. Uh, I know it's uh, Fred Ward and Uma Thurman. Um, I'm gonna guess is it Philip Kaufman? Is yeah, it? yeah, Philip mm-hmm. Kaufman, who did the right stuff. Mm-hmm. Just seemed like what a, yeah. what a leap to go, and it mm-hmm. it that was a movie I really I wanted. It's an era I love, but it just didn't quite work. Um, and she's such a fascinating person. Why did you want to write a book about her? I discovered her when I was about 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a literature student. I found her childhood diary when I was in a bookstore. And I spent all my, my week's lunch money to buy this childhood diary. Mm-hmm. She had been a, she, she started this diary at age 11 wow. when she and her mother and brothers were sailing across the Atlantic, coming to America <laughs> as immigrants. The father, her, her father had abandoned the family in Europe and they were devastated. They were coming to America to start a new life. And she started writing a letter to her father to lure him back to the family that letter ended up starting this writing habit, and she then continued the writing habit throughout her entire life. It became her diary, which many, many thousands and thousands of entries from 1914 till when she died in 77. So I stumbled upon this as a 20-year-old and went on the journey mm. and ended up doing a lot of work on her very complex life, very complex personality. And I was interested in why she was creative. And I had to hang on because there were moments when the ride was really perilous. There were sudden sharp turns that I wasn't expecting. And, uh, you know, I I almost flew off a few times because her life was just wild. And she was really trying desperately to to find happiness. Mm -hmm. So I thought, this is an incredible document that someone has chronicled their consciousness mm. their entire life. It's it's a document that was it had been secret for many years and then it was published in edited form starting when she was in her 60s and then later uh, those some of those parts that were edited out were published. That's where you get Henry and June because that was all secret. Her affair was a secret. With Henry Miller? Mm-hmm. Oh. And so that came out later after she and her husband, everybody had died. I see. Um, and uh, But then, oh, more secrets came, more secrets. And, and what a complex and fascinating person. So I wanted to really uh, write about what I thought were the, the, the main, main and most important things about her psychology and why she... About, it's really kind of a feminist story mm-hmm. because you know how Betty Friedan in the early 60s said um, that the, she described the problem that has no name. Right. You know, this whole feminist thing about why are women not satisfied? Anna East was grappling with that at starting in the early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And then as a young wife, she was married at age 20. She was grappling with this issue of what, why am I dissatisfied? And it had a lot of it had to do with the the the, the various pressures and repression of society, mm-hmm. and she so she started to throw away the taboos. You know, she was a little Catholic girl, and she was expected to get married, and she was expected she wasn't supposed to go get a job, and she wasn't supposed to write books about D. H. Lawrence, and she was, <laughs> and she was she wanted to do these things, but she didn't want to offend anyone, lose her family, upset her husband. Mm-hmm. So she started throwing these taboos away with abandon after a while. <laughs> The uh, it, it in the book and and again in the films the parts that I'm aware of it's as if the only part of her life that they really concentrated on ever was the sexuality, um, and, you know, blue writing and things like that. But she was so much more than that. One hundred percent. I what I find interesting is her emotional journey. 
Um, and of course, of course, uh, people would focus on the sex life, look for the, you know, and, and that is interesting, mm -hmm. but, but it's for all it, her lovers, the lovers and it. And she's kind of made out to be this nymphomaniac. Yeah. Um, but, and it, so I, it's, it's gets into some real interesting feminist territory because here we are in 2019 where we, we might call some of the ways she was treated as slut shaming, mm -hmm. you know? We we would we would say that um, she's being subjected to a pretty serious double standard. Right. You know, men men are allowed to men are allowed to and have done a lot of the things she did, but um, somehow coming from her, she attract uh, she brings on this this condemnation. You know, the moral right. the this moral judgment. And I find that interesting too. But I also had to deal with my own judgments as I was reading her work and cause I would get, sometimes I would feel angry with her. Like, how could you do that? <laughs> you know? And then I would have to, have to say, you know, have to uh, forgive her right. as, as you do with people, as you do with, with people, you, you need to, you need to understand people's complexity and forgive and, mm -hmm. and understand that we're, we're all just doing the best we can here. <laughs> well, it just seems like, again, in that era, women's roles were, you know, it was a fascinating time. You you know, what were they supposed to do if they wanted to be a writer? Uh, you know, their relationship was almost just as important. Who they were with, you know, became an entree into the right circles, you know, so balancing all of that. The uh, the other thing I found fascinating, I guess she had an affair with Gore Vidal, which oh. was something you you personally discovered. So, well, so there's a lot of uh, really interesting information there. So she did, had a friendship mm -hmm. with Gore Vidal. They met in the 1940s when he was 20 years old, the grandson of a senator, and she was 42. They met at a poetry <laughs> reading, and instantly he they, they they were just very attracted to one another's people. Mm -hmm. He asked if he could go home that night with her to continue talking, and they were very it was very intensive friendship. Um, it was they act they behaved as if they were jealous lovers actually, but at at a certain point, Anna East realized that the friendship would be one of absolute frustration for her. And so she started delicately pulling away from the friendship. And later on, much later, uh, after she was dead, Gore Vidal publicly trashed Ana East. He wrote, there's an entire chapter of his memoir, which is called Palimpsest, he that he devotes to trashing her. And I read his memoir and thought, what? Now, <laughs> If if she was to him what he says, why would he devote an entire chapter? This doesn't quite make sense. So I dug around. I wanted to know what really happened there. And I found a letter. And I see and write in my book about what exactly she did mean to him. And he just, of course, he misrepresented the entire thing after she died. Oh, that's... Wow. Terrible. <laughs> think he was threatened by her? Do you think men were threatened by her? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I think they were baffled, you know, by by her. Her She's bold. She was also incredibly feminine, though. She had the, the softest presence. Very, very soft, very feminine. Hmm. And yet there was this steeliness where she went after the things she wanted. And so... This wasn't okay with a lot of people. It was, you know, she was supposed to take the back seat. Uh, like for, I'll, just to give you an example, um, with, with Henry Miller. Now, she and Henry really um, championed one another. They were genuinely um, ter terrific friends, aside from the, the romance that ended up happening between them. Mm -hmm. They were tremendous champions of one another's writing. She even told him that Tropic of Cancer would be, he, he, he had some, a few possibilities and she said Tropic of Cancer, that's, that's the title. And she helped him get the book published. And she, I think she gave him quite a bit of money. Um, yet somehow 
uh, and he, and he, he adored her writing her. He called her the starry being. He thought she was a magnificent person and an incredible writer. Wow. He, you see it somehow he for years was seen as the legitimate genius, whereas she was just the little help mate right. who, um, who really wasn't as good. And by the way, she probably just wrote his coattails. Now I can easily disprove that by, uh, having gone through their letters and their notes, he uh, they had they had this grand love affair that lasted for a long time. It ended. They continued to be friends for a long time. But when she was going to publish her diaries, she had to get him to sign off because he would be mentioned as a major character in that first diary, Diary of Anais Nen, Volume 1, came out in the mid-60s. And his notes to her are so adorable and charming. He says... This stuff is magnificent," he said. "Sometimes I'm I'm embarrassed by my behavior, but I'm I don't want you to. It would be unfair to your diary for us to start cutting this stuff out. So go ahead." And he he was just rooting for her. So hmm. they championed one another, but the world kind of wanted to believe that he was the genius. She right. it, she was just some side point, you know. Well, that's always that's always sort of the standard narrative. It's really, and it just doesn't, you know, it it doesn't change. Right. The um, where are all of her things or papers? You got to sift through. To, where was her final home? In Silver Lake, Los Angeles. What? She's a writer. That's where all the writers are, right? It's great. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Silver Lake. Wow. What? Do you don't remember what street or anything? Oh yeah. Oh, oh I, I, I do. The... But yeah, they're they're <laughs> Hidalgo. People. But they they don't want they're they're nervous about people oh, okay. coming around. But but I did I did a lot of work in the home. Oh. I spent many many days and many wow. many hours. There's also material at UCLA. Yeah. Uh, in the special collections, you have to give permission and all that. But I spent many hours in the home digging through her file cabinets and boxes and drawers and closets and finding letters and uh. notes and incredible i you know incredible evidence for the life she was living yeah it's so interesting because a couple of weeks ago we had uh you know the the director of the be natural movie which is uncovering the work of uh alice key, of blanche. Alice key blanche and it's the same thing uncovering all of these artifacts yeah such an incredible you know holding things that they held and their family and i don't you know the legacy of the, all these women's histories oh yeah it's like a pilgrimage for me going there did you ever think about doing a documentary about her after re writing the book i mean you've got mm. you've done most of the hard mm. work now I haven't thought about that. Oh my God! Connect you to Pamela. Oh, we, uh, yeah, Pamela yeah. Green. She, she we did uh, be natural. Uh, I mean, just it sounds really exciting. And then the other thing too was uh, I don't want to ruin too much from the book, but that many years later she did meet her father and reunite with her father and mm -hmm. ends up having a relationship with. Him. Oh, oh Anais. <laughs> oh boy, this is a tough one. This is a really tough one for me personally. So. I, I, yeah, when I came across this, I was really shocked. So uh, I, apparently this is a phenomenon that does occur, though. She, uh, her father abandoned the family when she was, you know, 10, 11. Didn't see the man for 20 years. She was so, um, you know, it solidified him in her mind as like the god of her mind. You know, mm -hmm. like if you lose a beloved parent, they're, they become, they, they're just lodged in your subconscious mm -hmm. for all time. So she, and she was always told that she looked like him, that she acted like him, that she dressed like him, that she, like, like he was an artist. She, she was so like him. Finally, finally, they meet when, uh, in the 1930s, she, and so it's been 20 years since she's met the man. And apparently this is a phenomenon. Uh, it, it's been described in some other um, books but they met, and th there was absolute confusion, rom like a kind of romantic confusion between them. And they had a brief affair. Wow. And uh, she ended it. And he, I think, uh, chased her a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, when I came upon this as I was reading the diaries, I, I remember closing it pushing it aside and having to take a few deep breaths because that was a bridge too far for me. I 
knew that she had, she, in trying to throw off all the taboos, I knew she was trying to free herself. She had a lust for life. She was trying to find happiness. But in, in doing that, I thought that is a taboo that I, I can't even quite go there in mm-hmm. my mind. But she did. And apparently I've found that this is something that people do sometimes. I mean, it's, this is, um, Oedipus Rex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oedipus Rex is he meets his mother and, ha- and sleeps with his mother. And when he finds out, he blinds himself. So this is apparently something that happens. Right. And so then how much longer did she, after that, then she became a psychoanalyst herself? <laughs> yeah. It, I, it, it, Which she, is another. Yeah. So she went to therapy to discuss. <laughs> this is after her, the, the relationship mm-hmm. with her father. Yeah. With Otto Rank. And Otto Rank was a disciple of Freud. So she had a lot to talk about with him and she was so brilliant. She was just so brilliant that he made her one of his analysts and she analyzed people in New York. Well, and Freud was interested in the romantic connection between parents and children, right? Wasn't that Uh a big part of his? Yes. So maybe, maybe that helped her studies. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure it did. I, I, there's something called Freud talks about family romance. Uh He said that we're always replaying um, these were I mean, usually, usually for a little girl, it would be the father and for a little boy, it would be the mother. And that we subconsciously, we just can't help it. We cre- keep recreating this dynamic over and over in our lives, trying to solve this initial frustration that we loved our parent and couldn't have them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. I, mean, I love their crude ideas of, of trying to figure out it, it you know, psychoanalyze themselves somehow Mm -hmm. i mean not having any tools just like maybe if i sleep with my father it'll that'll that'll figure it out you know she she in trying to throw off the taboos so you you have to she was born in 1903 and they were still under the influence of the victorian era and so and she was catholic and she was catholic and she was a girl so she one by one started uh, throwing off the taboos. First of all, she left the church and then she started questioning this whole idea of sex. Like what's wrong with sex? Why can't I have sex? And she, she one, one by one started throwing, why can't I work? Why can't I dance on stage under my name and not have a stage name where it's supposed to be such a, an embarrassment for my husband. She started to throw off the taboos. And then I think with the father, it was yet another effort, and right. I believe that one was what was disturbing. It sounds like again, just of this era, that there's a lot of. I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking of Ali Nazimova yeah. and uh, Isadora Duncan. You know, women of that era trying to uh, understand their own feelings about sex. It, you know, and uh, coming out of the Victorian era, it's it's a really interesting, and I could see why she would like D. H. Lawrence mm-hmm. for that very reason, because he explores a lot of that also. Yeah, I adore Nazimova and those all the they they're trying. She was to a genius. I mean, again, yeah. Ali Nazimova is it was an auteur and a genius, mm-hmm. and it's just a tragedy again. It's so she was so inf- influential. I mean, there is no Lady Gaga without. Hmm. Ali oh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, she she they created all these gender bending. You know, they were exploring all of these, all of these things, and they were really brave. You know, so um, but yeah, she's another. But she sounds like it's she's in that that era of of these women trying to kind of understand what their role in society was. Without any guidance. Yeah. It it was a big thing. Now, now, Anna East and her husband, Hugo, were living in Paris at the time. And it was a thing to start to question the idea of marriage and and the the idea of being faithful. They had conversations about this Mm -hmm. because um, she talks about it in her diary quite a bit that the Catholic Church actually promoted the idea, have a miss, do, do not get divorced, have a mistress have have relationships on the side, and so they discussed this. They wondered if they were being um, um, like, uh, c- you know, hampered, crippled, repressed by by ha- being being sexually faithful to one another. So they tried to 
to talk about it, but it was painful for them because they didn't want to hurt one another, Mm -hmm. you know, but it was a thing at the time. So the, the free love idea, it was really a conversation. A lot of people were having in uh, definitely in Paris, definitely in the (laughs) twenties, you know, that for the old free love idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I am so excited. I can't wait to uh, read this. I have been, I've been sneaking little glimpses into it, but this is going to be really fun. And I hope you make either a documentary or a, a film out of it. A good idea. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I want to see it because, as I said, when I've seen her in movies, they it's not quite right. And plus, it was so much from the male's perspective, I think, that movie it really became about the whole movie is like about them having a menage a trois it's like that's the big scene we're waiting for Mm -hmm. as opposed to all the exciting things you said of trying to figure out who you are and all of you know all of that are you working on anything else aside from this or well always 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 things things. going on (laughs) Hari. i like all the women are they are kind of femme in your femme fatale yeah yeah, there, there's Wheelhouse. there's a there's another project I'm working on that has to do again with you know a woman trying to free herself. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, we'll keep on. Well, thank Kim. Thank you so much for thank being so on much. the show. I appreciate it and continued success. To you, Jeff, do you have any final Well, make sure, it, for us? is the book available for purchase now, Kim? I just want to make sure. Yeah, I know we, we have advanced here. copies. It is uh, it. available today. Amazon, cool. uh, Kindle, Audible. It will, uh, yes, there it is. Buy Great. a copy. Don't get a Kindle. Yes. Because I had a book, you know, you don't, they don't That's count. That's right. They don't count the sales. Do you know that about Kindle? Yeah, and Sorry, uh, tomorrow and on a thurs- the book. Thursday night, Book Soup, 7 o'clock. So <gasps> October 10th, book signing. Great. Great. Book soup. book soup. We love book soup. We love book soup, so make sure you check that out. And I just want to get the name right. Spy in the House of Anais Spy Nin. Spy right? in the House of Aeneas Nin by Kim Krizan. Perfect. And there Kim, thanks so much for being here. My Our pleasure. Our fans love this stuff. They love film yeah. and they love strong women. So it's the perfect guest to have today. It's so much um, fun. And uh, of course, you guys can buy that book on Amazon. Make sure you tune into the film scene every Thursday, guys. Yes. We pre-taped this, but this will be airing at Thursday at 2 p.m. Pacific, which is when we go live. Next week, we have Moby. Uh, Moby is going to be on the show. That's yes. going to be uh, earth shattering. Uh, believe it or not, we have done a film together. He's done <laughs> one film. It's Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'm in it with him, and uh, we'll be talking about that. But as we always say, everyone's life is like a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this is the end of our show for today. Thank you so much, Kim. My pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Hope it's cinematic. Bye.